Give us a sense of what you got out of it. What's the message? Well, the message is that recently, especially, central banking has become much more complex art than ever before. And the reason is we now have to face financial stability, price stability, but we are against the background of numerous real shocks, the pandemic, the war in the Ukraine that has profound implications about the functioning of financial markets as well as about price stability. One of the concerns that has been raised and put on the table is that central banks have become, quote, overburdened. Too many assignments are given to that body, important as it is, but one should really identify comparative advantage. Don't take upon your responsibilities that you, about, about which you cannot deliver. Price stability and financial stability are a very good menu. Okay, well, you know, 15 years of free money, basically, and central banks essentially supporting growth. Now, we've gone to a higher interest rate environment. This means perhaps a return to the old normal, as it were. Does this also mean that the structures for growth which were in place are still relevant? Well, innovation in the world has been dramatic, and therefore one cannot replicate what was 15 years ago. But you are absolutely right. We have seen a detour, a long detour, in which central banks have flooded the markets with cheap money for good reason, to avoid a recession, to avoid a collapse after the various shocks. And the key challenge is how to exit that particular detour. And the central banks are now in the midst of the exit. Interest rates have gone up significantly, and they will probably need to stay high for a while. And by the same token, central banks will need to uh, reabsorb some of the assets that they have uh, flooded the system with. So it's a challenge. And all of this against the background of governments being much more limited in their fiscal capabilities. Debt is very high. Budget deficits are high. And therefore, you do not have all the tools that you normally have to play with this economy. And as a result, central banks need to be on the alert for price stability and financial stability. But Jacob, I mean, I put it to you this way. OK, we had, of course, quantitative easing and maybe created asset bubbles in places you didn't want them. But now you've got the reverse quantitative tightening and also higher interest rates. So, you know, accommodation is gone in monetary policy. Why then are we getting such a lag in terms of it working? And that brings me to another question. What they did before, did it actually make any difference? Well, to begin with, a quantitative tightening is much more difficult than quantitative easing, because you are operating in markets that have not seen these kind of dislocations. And the second point is, it is, uh, uh, you know, it's not just reversing what you did before. It's adjusting yourself to a new reality, a new reality in which, against the, in which, in the background, you have had the results of flooding the markets in the post-pandemic event in order to prevent the distortion there. It is challenged by the fact that the Ukrainian war has created, is creating challenges to food, to grain, to trade to supply chains, and all of those are disruptive. Now, central banks the, should not take everything upon themselves. That's where governments must come in. Now, the cost to the economy comes from rigidities. And the rigidities require what the economist will call structural policies, those policies that reduce the distortions in the economic system, that allow resources to move freely from one place to another. And when I hear that we are in an era of fragmentation, in an era of deglobalization, I read the map and I read the leaves, but I'm worried about it. Because while the appetite for globalization may have been reduced, the degree of interdependence is still there. Jacob, I'm going to put it to you another way. If we've had 15 years of free money and we've really avoided a major recession, do we, and it's a horrible thing to say, but do we need a recession as almost a, a, a cleaning process, a cleanser? You see, when you say free money, it sounds like something good. And what we have is, you have enjoyed the meal, and now you have indigestion. Was the enjoyment of the meal worth it? 
to suffer from the indigestion. And we in order to do the calculus and to give you a full answer, you need to combine them both. Yes, we have had free money, and it was intended to, for a good cause. The exit from it has been a little bit delayed, and that's why it will take a little bit more time. But I believe that now we are on the right path. And the Federal Reserve, as uh, Jay Powell has announced, we are, going to, we are not going to rush into anywhere. We are not going to miss the target again. And we are going to make sure that the target is achieved and it's not going to be overnight. So don't expect a path of reducing interest rates back to where it was. It was too long. That's a mistake being made by uh, it's almost markets fighting against what central banks are doing very quickly. Well, I don't think I call it mistakes. I would say that uh, this is the. I path didn't call of, it a mistake, by the way. <laughs> this is the path of adjustment. You have had interest rates which were abnormally low. We now need to restore expectations and stability, so interest rates are being raised. They may be now abnormally high relative to the very long run, but it is premature to start lowering them too quickly. Don't declare victory too early. Jacob, I, I would be abrogating my responsibilities and then talk to you about geopolitics and uh, the, the conflict with Hamas. How do you think the Bank of Israel should be looking? What prism should they be looking at this through? Well, the Bank of Israel, I believe, is doing really a, a very important contribution now by ensuring that the financial system in Israel operates smoothly, by ensuring that uh, there are no bottlenecks, and by dealing with mortgages and things of that type. But the budget department has to do with this. The as budget well. department needs to do that, and indeed, there will be a budgetary cost. The debt of a government will be higher than what it was before. Inflationary pressures might be higher than what they were before. And growth will be somewhat lower than what it was before. Right. But the key issue is how long will it last? And as long as it lasts up to the beginning of 2024, I think that based on the past record, Israeli economy has shown strong resilience and ability to make up for those losses. So the key issue is we need to complete the military uh, activities as soon as possible by reaching the targets. Well, of course, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has uh, talked about, of course, this, this judicial process, or judicial reform. It's put on hold, of course, as of October. Moody's downgrading its outlook on Israel. What is the deal here? as a central banker, and indeed, what are the implications for the economy longer term? So I will answer not as a central banker, but as an observer and uh, with a, a person who has very strong views. I think that the so-called judicial reform, which I would call a judicial overall, has been misplaced and would, would have been damaging to the economy and society in Israel. And indeed, the degree of protests, very healthy protests that have been in the streets, I think that they, they have successfully removed it from the table. And what Moody's was doing was really emphasizing the fact that the democratic forces, as reflected by the forces in the streets of people who care for the future of Israel and its democracy, won the day and win the day. So I very much hope that also not only de facto, but also the jure, this will be taken off the table.